I want to thank Saracen for participating in this study and for all the breeders and vets that also helped us. I need to also acknowledge another one of our feed partners in Lexington, Kentucky, Hallway Feeds. We've worked with, as Polly mentioned, Saracen for 21 years. We've worked with Hallway for 30 years. They're undoubtedly the biggest and best thoroughbred uh, horse feed company for feeding both the thoroughbred breeding industry and the racehorse industry. And all of the data that I'm going to show today, they're responsible for actually gathering. So I wanted to make sure that, that I acknowledge them as well. So I've been dealing in the thoroughbred breeding industry since the mid-1980s in Kentucky. And when I first got there, the very first thing that I knew was that breeders were extremely interested in what was going on with skeletal soundness. And so we began to weigh and measure horses early on. Now this isn't a yearling on the scale, that's Seattle Slough actually. So that was in 1987. So we started weighing horses very early on. And we felt like that weight and growth rate had an effect on skeletal soundness. And we've been looking at it a long time and this is not a new problem, but I think we found some new answers. I had to put this up. This is a magazine cover from 1994, 28 years ago. And the folks standing here on the left is a youthful Wayne McElraith. You mentioned uh, Wayne, uh, or Nick, you mentioned Wayne a second ago, and that's Larry Bramblidge standing in the middle. And this was a magazine cover that covered a, a roundtable discussion we had then on developmental orthopedic disease. So it was what were the factors that led to DOD and how do we deal with them? So I was in here as the token nutritionist against these two guys who are kind of legends in terms of orthopedics. Uh, and I was advocating even at that point that growth was very important. So today I want to talk about some of the findings we've had through the years, including this, this new neat stuff that, that uh, I've never presented to anyone before, uh, actually. And I'm going to concentrate on the bottom two. Nick already did an excellent job of explaining the different types of developmental orthopedic disease. I'm going to talk about OC, OC and OCD. Now, when I first got in the business, there had been a study that was done at Ohio State that got everybody's attention and got the breeding industry all worked up, and that was showing that specific trace minerals, particularly copper, were important in this problem. So everyone got laser focused on copper, adding copper to the feed. We still add copper to the feed, but the problem didn't go completely away. We published our first work on growth back in, I think in 1996 was the paper, but this came from a four-year study we did on a big stud in uh, Kentucky where we weighed and measured the foals and we looked at the incidence of OCD. We used surgical OCD as the parameter that we wanted to have to measure the incidence. It was 10%, remember that number. And we found even in that early study that heavier foals and I'm talking young foals, 25 days of age, those that were heavier had more hock and stifle OCD. About that time, Hallway Feed started a weighing service. And this is really why we know as much as we know about uh, growth and some of these issues. Steve Cadell at Hallway started a service where he would go over around the studs once a month, he would weigh the foals, he'd measure their height, and he would condition score the horses and he'd weigh the lactating mare if, it, if the foal was by its side. He has done that for the last 30 years. We now have a, a total in our database of 47,000 foals that we've weighed and measured around the world. And, <coughs> excuse me, much of it came from uh, Steve's work. So a lot of the data I'm gonna show you before is from Steve's data. It's a great data set because it's every single month they've gone and they've weighed the horses. The thing they don't do in this service, and I'll say it now before I forget it, is they don't weigh birth, they don't measure birth weight because they don't necessarily show up on the day that the horse is born. So some of the data that we have on birth weight was not done in this weighing service. Early on when we were measuring this, we published some data on just regular growth rate of foals, 350 colts and, and fillies. And we found something really surprising. If you look at the way that these horses are growing, like the slide that Nick showed, you have average daily gain high and then it de decreases with age. 
until you get into this. You get a lot of this type of what seemed to be noise out there when the horses got to be about 11 to 15 months of age. I've got month of age on the x-axis here. If I change that to the season of the year, it makes sense. You can see that that happened in April. And at that point, every single yearling, regardless of when it was born, starts to grow fast again. That's when our grass comes on. We also saw, saw though, that April-born foals grew a lot faster even in their first year. So that was new and uh, had not been reported before. Until that point, the, the real gold standard for thoroughbred growth was from this study, and this was actually my major professor at Cornell that did this. They measured a bunch of growth rates at Winfields Farms in Canada. And in this data set, it's a great data set, I think the minstrels in this, I think Northern Dancer had already left when they had uh, done this set. But this was considered how thoroughbred foals grew until we measured them in Kentucky. And they didn't grow in Kentucky like they did in Canada. Canada's cold in the winter, season's completely different, their growth rates were different. So we saw that where the foal was raised made a difference. Since that time, we've been measuring uh, growth all over the world. This is a study we published where we looked at growth rates in England, America, Australia, New Zealand, India, and where they're grown makes a big difference. They grow differently depending on where they're raised. We started to get so much data that it was hard for us to process. So we created a software program about 2000, 2001 called GrowTrack. And this is a program that we provide to breeders that Saracen provides to their customers so that we can track growth. I'll tell you at the end of the day about a new iteration of GrowTrack that's really cool. It's a cloud-based program where you can use a cell phone app and that sort of thing. But we've been using this program to collect our data. It allows us to summarize the data and more importantly con compare how these foals are growing to another population of foals. And to do this, we use percentiles. And you're going to have to get used to that, that terminology because a lot of the data I'm going to show you is percentiles here. And what a percentile does, if any of you have children and you've taken them to the pediatrician, they measure, they'll give you the, the baby's size as a percentile of the population. So it literally converts how many kilos uh, a baby or a foal is into where does that stand as a percentile of the population and it's based on the population having this type of normal distribution of growth. This is what it looks like in foals. This is for thoroughbred colts specifically. I've got body weight here over on the x-axis. I've got the age down here. The middle line here is the median for the entire population of these foals, and that's from 21,000 foals. And then we look at percentiles, how far off is an individual foal from that, and how far off they are depends on how old they are. If you look at 30 days of age, there's about an 8 kilo spread from the median above or below uh, to get to the 25th or 75th. 25th means that that foal is bigger than 25% of the population, but it's smaller than 75. 75 is just the opposite. When you get up at the other end, you can see as 540, which may be when you had a yearling, there's a 22 kilo spread between the 25th and the median and the 75th. So there would be 44 kilos of difference here between a foal that was in the 25th to the 75th. So again, the reference curve that I'm using here is an international curve. It's got 47,000 foals in it, <coughs> excuse me, 23,000 colts, 23,000 fillies. Most of it, well, over half of these data came from our Kentucky data set, 54% of these foals. But for these studies, I wanted it to be international. So we included data. These are all thoroughbreds, but from all over the place. So 13% of them came from Europe, mostly from UK. 27% came from Australia, New Zealand, threw in a few from Japan and even India. Uh, so we've got quite a mix here, but it's a, it's a robust data set with 47,000 foals. We have a different reference set for fillies than colts. They grow at a different size. 
So we use a different set of equations. We put it all into this table, and the data that I'm going to show you today, I'm going to talk about four different age groups. And this is important that you understand this. I'm going to talk about foals, and that can be a birth weight up to 30 days of age. The second is from 31 to 180 days. We call it suckling. It's not exactly when they're on the mare, but it's close. Weanling would be from 181 to 360, and then yearling is anything over 360. So I'm going to refer to these data in those three groups. I'm going to give a single percentile in each of those groups. In some instances, the foal may have been weighed five times during that time. If they have, we give them as an average percentile for each of those groups. And these are what the data look like when we graph it inside the new program. Here we have uh, the, the percentiles as a foal, suckling, weanling, and yearling. The green here would be the weight percentile. The blue would be the height percentile. I'm going to show you this in two different forms. One is as percentiles. Percentiles are 0 to 100, so we'll be in that scale. The other is quartiles. And so it'll be first quartiles from 0 to 25, second 25 to 50, third 25 to 75, fourth quartile is greater than 75. So I'm going to keep switching back and forth when I'm referring to the data. Four different age groups, either quartiles or percentiles. Uh, the first set of data that we've collected that, I, that I'm going to present is the U.S. data. I'll put an American flag when I'm talking specifically about those data. This was done with the guys at Hallway. We use for this data set 13 different thoroughbred farms in Kentucky, uh, data from 2014 to 2018. This data set has 1,400 foals in it, so that would be 41 individual foal crops. Of those 1,400 foals, we have complete data, uh, growth data, we have all their sales and racing data, and 1,028 of them, we also have radiograph reports. I'm going to talk today about survey radiographs and surgery. I'm not going to talk about sales radiographs. So from this, we've got growth data and we have performance data. We have now combined this with the data that was collected here by Saracen with the help of the several different vet groups. This uh, group is six individual farms. The data goes back to 2005, so it's quite a bit late, uh, a longer period than the Kentucky ones, but it has 1,716 foals. So it's quite a big set, 48 different foal crops. For this one, we've got 760 of these foals that we have survey radiographs. So that's, we'll have radiographic data for 760. So when I'm talking about uh, OCD incidents, it's from that 760. When I'm talking about sales and racing, it's from the whole 1700. Again, we've got birth weights in many instances. I think there's about 900 or so foals in this that we have birth weights monthly weights, body weight and, and wither height, and then performance data. Uh, this, all of the data here was self-collected by the farms. The weighing service in Kentucky, they come bring the scale and they do it on a regular basis. This was by the farms and it's not as uniform as the Kentucky data because some of the farms don't weigh as regularly as we do in Kentucky. Hopefully when we finish seeing these data, everybody will decide they should be weighing regularly. So we wanted to divide these two different populations into subpopulations. One of them, which we're obviously interested in, is performance. So we're looking at starters, winners, stakes, winners, graded stakes, or millionaires. And then in skeletal disease, we divided them into no OCD. And then OCD based on either that spring survey or surgery. And so obviously the numbers in the survey are higher than surgery. It's the same population, but not all of the ones that have OCD in a, in a radiograph actually get operated. I'm going to talk in fairly large buckets of OCD, fetlocks, hocks, and stifles. There are other issues as well. In fetlocks, you can have fragments and you can have chips. And as Nick has already said, stifle cysts. Uh, which I will talk a bit about. We also divided these into month of year. 
that they were born, when the foal was born, that's a really important uh, topic, and uh, the parody of the mare. Were they out of maiden mares or were they multiparous? And that turned out to be a very important topic. So if we look at the overall groups that we're talking about, again, the, uh, the Kentucky date, I'm using an American flag, not a Kentucky flag. You probably wouldn't know what a Kentucky flag looks like. Uh, and then, and I apologize, there's one Irish farm in here, but I'm going to use the Union Jack anyway, so apologies, Ireland. Um, of the sets, they're pretty uniform. About 30% of the yearlings from these groups were not sold. Now, they may have not been sold because they were never presented for sale, uh, because they were really good or really bad, or they may have been presented to a sale and withdrawn before this, or entered in a sale and drawn withdrawn before they were sold, but it's a pretty uniform group. I converted the American into pounds so we can compare it a little bit better. Average sale price 132 versus 137 for the UK ones, median 59, 52. And I put in the percentage of the session median. And so if you have different quality foals, yearlings that are sold in different types of sessions, you want to see it, how did they fit compared to the other sessions. And what you can see is both of these sets are really good. The, uh, the UK yearlings averaged 190% of the ses session median. So these farms that participated have really good foals. And the session median was 123 and this uh, median uh, the average for the, the Kentucky ones was 165. So these are actually elite uh, horses that we're talking about here that are in this survey. Racing statistics, about 20% of them were unraced. Uh, there were 6.1% stakes winners from the American 5.7 from the, the UK. 3.3% of these horses were graded stakes winners. So again, it was a good group of horses and it's a pretty uniform group between the two populations. I'm gonna start talking about birth weight and birth weight I'm not gonna show you as a percentile. I'm gonna show you actually in kilos. After birth weight, it switches over to the percentiles. This is a graph that shows the distribution of birth weights in UK born foals and we had 931 of them compared to our global database <laughs> with 12,000 foals. And so this is the distribution, the percentage in each of these different age brackets here. The median birth weight for all 12,000 is 55 kilos. The UK is a little above that, 56 kilos. So there's a little bit of a difference there. If we compare these, the American, the Kentucky, and the UK ones, the American ones, if you see down here, they have, they're not quite as many small ones, and there's more large ones. But overall, it looks fairly similar, the growth patterns. The thing that we found here and in the U.S. is parity makes a huge difference. This is a graph of the distribution of birth weights for maiden mares versus multiparous. And this is if we put all of the multiparous into a single group. You can see there's a huge difference here. The average weight of maiden mares is eight kilos lighter than multiparous mares. So there's a big, big difference there. We've seen that same type of difference around the world. So here are maidens that were born in, the red ones are from UK, the blue ones are from the US, and the green ones is from a single farm in Australia, and this actually is 1,200 foals, and it's a farm that is one of the best ones in Australia. So they tended to be a little smaller than the other two. The median for maiden mares from UK was 49 pounds from the US, about, or, sorry, kilos, 51 from the US, and about 47 and a half from Australia. These are the multiparous ones out of those same groups. You can see that from the UK, the median uh, weight is 57 for, uh, for UK, 58 for US, and about 56 for Australian. So, same sort of patterns that hold in both of those. This is what the data actually looks like. Every one of those little dots is a foal. And so these are the ones that I just showed you the averages for. On the right, I have the multiparous. That black line in the middle is the median for that population. 
and you can see there's all the spread. That's the, the UK horses, the American horses, the Australian horses. Over on this side is what maidens look like. And you can see if you look at their medians that they're quite a bit larger. The span is sort of similar, but it's all down a notch. Well, let's get into some money talk here. Let's look at stakes winners and birth weight. And if you look at that, here we have, so these are stakes winners. These are UK stakes winners here. These are the stakes winners in this population that we had birth weights for. There were some stakes winners in the population that they didn't have a birth weight, but these are the ones that we have that. I have put some guardrails here. I've got 64 kilos at the top and 44 at the bottom. And I'm going to try to make an argument of why those are important weights to try to keep within for birth weight. If you look, there's a few uh, UK foals that were above 64 that ended up stakes winners. There's four in this population, almost none in the American, none in the Australian ones. If you look at the maidens, they're quite a bit smaller. These are stakes winners that were out of maiden mares. And with the exception of Australia, none of these got below 44. So that was kind of the bottom in terms of stakes winners, except for a couple of these Australian ones. And these were fillies, and one was actually a group one winner. So you could have a, a smaller foal, and it seemed like in Australia, but for most of these, they stay kind of in the middle. These are the same data for UK and the US, but I threw in all of the horses, all of the foals. You can see of all the UK foals, 7% of them, of the foals born, are greater than 64 kilos, and 5% are less than 44. If you look at stakes winners, 7% were above that. That's those four horses. Zero were below 44 kilos. So here's 5% of the UK foals born below 44, and none of them were stakes winners. If you look at American foals, a whopping 13% are greater than 64 kg. So there are a lot of big foals, but look at the number of stakes winners. There's one, uh, only 2%, and there are none below 44. So I think the U.S. probably is uh, on the high side and not too bad on the low side, but the, the, uh, the U.K. foals, there tend to be quite a few small ones that end up not being stakes winners. If we look at how they do at the sales and how much they earn during their career, I've done this for the top 10% in our population. So the top 10% of foals for both sales prices, yearlings, or 10% in earnings. And you see here it gets even narrower. Only 3% of the top 10 in sales were greater than 64 kilos as foals and only 2% below. Uh, and in earnings, only 4% of the horses uh, were above 64 and 2% below. So in between 64 and 44 kilos were 95% of the foals that were in the top 10%. Uh, in the, the U.S., they would had a tendency to be a little bit bigger. In terms of sales, 12% were above 64. I'm going to switch now. Instead of talking about birth weight, I'm going to go to the percentile data that I was talking about. And this is what the U.S. data looks like. All of those little dots are individual foals. This is the percentile. It goes from zero, that's the smallest, to 100, which is the highest. The median, again, is uh, the, the uh, black line here. And this is the four age groups that I was telling you about. So this is foal, suckling, weanling, yearling. You see they're similar looking in this U.S. population, but look how it's sort of funnel shaped, where they're a lot more up here than down here. You can see that the, the average percentile is 60 here. It's above the median. America has big foals compared to this global database. This is the UK database. And you'll notice here, one, for the first age group, we don't have all of the foals identified because they hadn't been weighed. Uh, but you can see in general, they're kind of congregated up here more towards the top. But look at as yearlings. That funnel is upside down. And if you look at the averages, 
as foals are 59, that was very close to the American data, but look as they get older, sucklings, weanlings, and finally yearlings, it's in the 41st percentile. So these are the differences in the size of UK foal, uh, thoroughbreds versus American. And this was a finding that, that I went, wow, that's a very interesting difference. They start as the same size. The American ones stay that size. The UK ones get relatively smaller as you go. And so as yearlings, there I showed you what that difference was in terms of kilos. They're significantly lower. And that three dots means it's, it's highly statistically significant. So how does yearling weight and height, uh, what does that have to do with sales or racing performance? I'm going to show you data now from only weights that were taken from 360 days or bigger. Again, I put it in percentile, and you have to put it in percentile if you're going to compare all of the different horses in a population. Here's a 540-day filly, uh, day old filly, and the median's 450 kilograms. If that had been a colt, it would have been 465. And if it had been a 570-day-old filly, it would have been 459. So the size, the age, and the gender make a big difference in where they are in terms of percentiles. So in order for us to compare an entire population, we've got to look at all of these different, uh, we have to convert them into percentiles. These are the sales data. The top 10% of the yearlings sold in the U.S. and in U.K. And this is really striking also. This time I'm doing it in quartiles. Look at the American yearlings. Any of you that buy at the American sales probably have recognized this. But 50% of the, the foals that were in the top 10% of sales were in the fourth quartile as yearlings. And 25 were in the third quartile. So that means 75% of the foals that were sold in uh, the yearling sales in the U.S. were above the median. Look at the U.K. foals. This is also in the top 10%. But look where most of them were. They were in the second quartile for weight. And if you look at the fourth quartile, these are the biggest yearlings. Only 12% of them were in the top 10%. Uh, 10 percent of sales yearlings. So the UK market was discriminating against real big foals that were big as yearlings, where in the US it's a completely different game. They sell big yearlings. Are the buyers right? Are they getting it right about which ones are actually going to become good runners? Here is the data for stakes winners. And this is the yearling percentile again, well the quartile, this is American stakes winners. 44% of the horses that win stakes in the U.S. were in the top quartile or the fourth quartile. But look at the, the ones that win stakes in U.K. It was in the second quartile that they were the highest. So the stakes winners were exactly the same as the way that they sold. Those that, that sold well in the second quartile went on to be good racehorses. Uh, so if we look at, that was stakes winners, now let's just look at the percentage, the top 10% of earners. These are the best 10% of the horses that we measured. Again, we're looking at how heavy they were as yearlings. If you look at UK, it's the second quartile. If you look at the US, it's the fourth, uh, the fourth quartile. This is body weight. This is height. For height, the top earners were both in the third quartile. So there was a difference in their body weight, but not their body height. And if you look for sort of that sweet spot for racing performance of UK yearlings, it was second quartile weight, third quartile height. In the US, it was the same third quartile height, but it was the fourth quartile for body weight. So we're starting to see that there's a difference between these two groups of horses. This is, I threw this one in for fun. These are millionaires. These are horses in the data sets that had won over an, an, a million dollars. So I converted pounds to dollars in this case. You can see that in both instances, they were the same when they were foals, 
but look at how they were when they were weanlings and yearlings. The ones that were millionaires in the U.S. were in the 71st percentile. The U.K. millionaires, the average was the 40th percentile. What about month of birth? If we look at month of birth, just all of the folds in our study, you see that there's, this is so January, February, March, April, May. You can see that it, in general, the UK foals were born a little earlier than the American foals. And if I put it in this orientation, you can see. So this is the percentage of foals from UK. This is the percentage from the US. So there tended to be the UK foals uh, tilted more towards February and March, and the American ones a little heavier towards April and May. How do they do it as racehorses? 35% of all of the foals from the Kentucky study were born in February, and that's compared to only 24 of the total foals. So February was a good month for stakes winners in the U.S. Guess what? It's a good month for stakes winners in uh, UK also, 34%, and again, out of 28% total. If you look at that as a percentage of the foals in each of those months, the overall average of stakes winners in UK was 5.7. In February, it was 6.9. For the US, it was 8.7. What about OCD and body weight? Well, again, we've got this subpopulation of horses that are no OCD, and then we divided them into these different buckets. Now, as Nick very nicely explained, when we talk about stifle lesions, we're talking about two completely different parts of the joint. And I've treated these different areas differently in our analysis. We have the lateral trochlear ridge that's uh, up here, and those are typically OCDs, and I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, those that end up having surgery. And then in the medial femoral condyle is where you get mostly cysts. And they're really completely different types of lesions. And I'll show you in a second, the body weight seem to be different as well. When you're looking at the medial femoral, con femoral condyle, which Nick also explained, for radiographically, there's a lot of different findings on surveys. Some of them are described as shallow lucencies, and these are American terms here. I think there's, there's a few different uh, UK ones too. But in terms of severity, you can go from shallow lucency, lucency, sclerosis, deep sclerosis, and then a subchondral cyst. That's the way that they were described on these different radiographs. And they're typically not necessarily operated like an OCD. They're more treated medically or with the screw that Nick uh, was uh, mentioned as well. When we look at how these horses race, uh, it looks like all of the, the horses that didn't have OCD, about 22% of the American horses didn't race. If you look at horses that had stifle, uh, lateral trochlear ridge, OCD surgery, 36% of them were unraced. If you look at the medial femoral condyle cyst, and I threw deep sclerosis in here as well, same sort of lack of racing. So those two lesions seem to affect the, uh, the uh, probability of the horses racing a lot more than hocks. You see that actually for hock surgery, the more of them raced and Fetlock was sort of middle of the road. We also looked at the age of first start for each of these, and we saw that there wasn't any difference really, which is a little different than what some of the other data had showed. Uh, so, stifles, whether it's a cyst or an, an OCD, are pretty important lesions that we need to worry about. This is what the data looks like for the horses that had OCD surgery. So we've got survey and we've got surgery. And you can see that this shape is even more pronounced here. The horses that had OCD surgery, their average percentile was 73, and they stayed pretty big the entire time. If we compare this to the rest of the population, well, first of all, let's look at just the ones that had OCD surgery. This blue over here is when they were 1 to 30 days old. And if you look, 58% of the ones that had surgery were in the fourth quartile. Big foals, 
They weren't big foals necessarily as yearlings. It was happening when they were small. If you compare those that had OCD surgery to those that didn't have OCD surgery, you see there's a big difference from when they were 1 to 30 days old or 31 to 180. Those are different, but out here the difference goes away. If we compare OCD surgery and no surgery for height, we see the same thing, that the foals that had OCD surgery were taller as well as heavier. And then finally, let's look at stakes winners versus those that had OCD surgery, and very few of those are the same horses, except for hock surgery. Most of the ones that are stakes winners did not have OCD surgery. You see that the ones that are stakes winners started as normal size, 60. They got bigger and were up at 67 uh, when they were uh, yearlings. But look at the ones that had OCD compared to that. So it was the younger ones uh, where they were heavier. These are data from the UK study, and this is from the survey OCD. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough measurements of height from 1 to 30 days. Most of the people here that were measuring weight from 1 to 30 days and birth weight weren't taking a withers height. So we were missing some data there. But if you look out here as weanlings and yearlings, the horses that had OCD in the surgeries here were actually taller. So there was the same sort of trend there. If we look at birth weights, here on the left we have the English birth weights. The green is all of the foals. See that little blip there? These are horses that had OCD in the survey. You can see there was a little blip of bigger uh, foals then. Same little blip happens in the U.S., but at a slightly even heavier birth weight. This is a really interesting finding. <clears throat> we looked at the incidence of OCD in foals that were out of either maiden mares or out of multiparous mares. And we compared when they, the survey results for OCD, the surgical results for OCD, and then the lateral trochlear ridge surgeries. Maiden, foals out of maiden mares had 30% less OCD than mares out of multiparous. And if you look at stifle lateral trochlear ridge OCD, it was 70% less. And the data was very uniform, whether it was here or whether it was in the U.S. For U.S. mares, the incidence of that, that stifle surgery was 2.8. For maidens, it was 0.7. Here, multiparous was 2.8, and for maidens, 0.8. So they're identical. Maidens seem to be protective against OCD, and that might be a body weight thing. If we look... And in this case, we compare all foals that don't have OCD, stakes winners, which are the blue, and then the red, which is uh, OCD surgery, you can see that there's a big difference. The ones that win stakes tend to look like the rest of the population, the no OCD. The ones that have OCD, it's clustered here in the top. And if you look at the averages there, they show it. So... Stakes winners from 1 to 30 days tend to be ordinary sized, where the ones that get OCD tend to be on the, the high side. And again, if you do it in quartiles, it sticks out 58% of those that had OCD surgery were in that fourth quartile. Stakes winners were just like those that didn't have OCD at all. If we move on and, and look specifically at stifle OCD surgery, which from our data seems to be the, the most severe, you can see this becomes even more pronounced. 64% of the foals that, that yearlings that ended up having stifle OCD surgery were uh, in the fourth quartile. So it's even more magnified for stifles. And this is birth weights. The ones that we had birth weights on that had stifle OCD if you do a relative risk ratio, it's a statistical procedure to see are you more at risk if you're at a certain weight. If a foal was greater than the median, born greater than the median, 55 kilos or greater, it was 10 times more likely to have stifle surgery than if it was born below that. So there's a risk there. 
The, uh, the UK data wasn't as clear. It was a relative risk of 2.5, but that wasn't statistically significant. If we look at stifle uh, uh, OCD again, relative risk ratio of 4.1. So basically it's saying that if you've got a big foal, you're, you have a much higher risk of having stifle OCD. These are the data for horses that didn't have surgery, those that medial femoral condyle group that we were talking about. Now this is all of them, there's 78 of them. So this is whether it was identified as a lucency, clear up to assist, and then we had stifles that were radiographic and stifles that were surgery. You can see here that the medial femoral condyle looks just like the regular population. There doesn't seem to be a difference in size. So it seems to be different than the lateral trochlear ridge. Lateral trochlear ridge, they seem to be bigger as foals. The, the uh, medial femoral condyle cyst and uh, lucencies, not so much. This slide shows stifle and hock OCD, and I wanted to show that surgery. You, you're getting the picture now that look at the cluster of big foals, and we're still talking about the first 30 days uh, compared to those that don't have surgery. This is height, or this is body weight, but that's height. And you can see that bigger foals have, and this is a relative risk ratio of 2.7 uh, for height as well. So what about month of birth in OCD? Turns out that this is a real important parameter as well. Uh, I showed you these data already. February is a good month for stakes winners in both the US and UK. This is the incidence, total incidence of survey radiographic incidence of OCD. In UK, it was 13.9. Remember that slide that Nick showed from that earlier study, it was 13% incidence of OCD. So this actually agrees quite a bit with those data, and it was a little bit higher, 14.5 in the US. But look when they occurred. These are months of birth. April, there was 19% incidence of OCD in Kentucky. And look at May in UK. 22% of the foals that were born in May in this study had radiographic evidence of OCD. And that's compared to less than 14 overall. So it was very skewed towards May. If we break these down into which joint was affected, this is the US data, January, February, March, uh, April, May. You can see that there was a high incidence of OCD in April foals in America. That blue is hocks. And see, that's a big amount of the, the OCD that we see in the US, 19%. This is the UK data. And this is survey radiographs again. One, you see very little hock OCD anytime compared to the Americans. But look at the stifle OCDs that are occurring in May. Now remember, that's only 7% of the total foals, but the incidence of stifle OCD is quite high. Switch to surgery now. This is the American data, average 9.3. I told you about that study from 25 years ago. We found 10%, so it's a very similar type thing. Again, April's when we had the most surgery, but look at the amount of hocks and stifles. It seems that hocks and stifles were what was going on there. This is the incidence of surgery of the horses in the UK population. And look out in January, there was a total incidence of 2.5% of the foals. And in March and even April, it was below five. Uh, April was 4%. There was this big spike in stifle OCD in those May foals. So the question is why? So if we look at, again, I'm gonna put stakes winners as being good and stifle OCD surgery is not being so good. Um, February is a good month for growing, having a foal in uh, America. 35% of the stakes winners, only 16% of the stifle OCD. April, a uh, little lower incidence of, our incidence of stakes winners, but 44% of our stifle OCD comes from there. And look at UK. February is the best month, but look at May. Only 7% of the foals and 32% of the 
of the stifle surgery that occurred here. It's a small population, but that really sticks out that May is different. I mentioned Hawk OCD being different in UK versus the US. When the veterinarians we started working with here were looking at our data from the US, they're going, guy, you've got a lot of Hawk OCD. This is more than we see. And it turns out that's exactly right, that the overall incidence of Hawk OCD surgery was 2.6 in the UK population, 6% in the American population. And look at April and March, there's an 8% incidence of stifle surgery in April foals there. So it's very different between the two groups. Fortunately, that type of Hawk surgery in the US is not really that important for sales or performance. In fact, if you look at them, they sold at a higher average rate. Now remember, the surgeries occurred after the spring survey. So they didn't show up in sales radiographs. They would have appeared in the, in the repository, I guess, as a, as a note. But they sold well. And if you look at their racing data, they actually had more stakes winners and more grade one winners that had Hawk surgery compared to those that didn't. So it wasn't, it's not the, the, the really bad outcome that we're seeing with the stifle issues. April foals again, this is April foals that had stifle or that had OCD surgery. Look at all of them above the 50th percentile. So it's very tilted towards big foals. And I'm still talking about the one to 30 day old weight. In May foals born in UK, they are significantly bigger than, mare, than foals born in January or February. So they are statistically bigger than these. And if you look at the incidence of stifle OCD in the radiographs, you can see that that's correlated with the size of those May foals. And if we look at um, the, the ones that we had that required uh, stifle surgery of the lateral trochlear ridge, you can see that these are the May foals in UK. You see a big error bar here. So that means there weren't very many and there's, there's more variability. But if you look across, it seems like they were big foals. This is weight and this is height. So it seems like the same sort of trend is occurring, but it's happening in May. So why is this correlation between uh, OCD that we're measuring in spring surveys and operating at 360 days, why is the first 30 days so important? That's the real critical question. And it comes to how the bone develops. Now Nick's already done a nice job explaining how the bone develops. But the key here is when that vasculature occurs in the cartilage. When that vascular uh, is in the cartilage and it's being converted to bone is the time when a lot of these OCDs form. And since the mid 2000s, there's been some great work that came out of Scandinavia from the vet school in Norway where they've looked at the etiology and pathogenesis of osteochondrosis. And what they've seen, they studied it first in pigs and they found osteochondrosis is a big problem in pigs. They found that there, there was a high relationship in pigs and then they also studied it in horses, this disturbance in ossification that causes OCD and the failure of the blood supply to the epiphyseal growth cartilage. Now that vascular supply is early in the foal's growth. These are some, some diagrams from that group in Norway. And this shows that the tip of a very young foal's um, bone. And you can see this is all still cartilage. There is lots of vasculature here. This is the bone up here and this is advancing down. As you see it advancing down, this vasculature is what is, is providing nutrients to allow the bone to uh, the cartilage to convert to bone, which again, Nick has already shown. And so as the, the animal grows, this bone, this ossification front here progresses down. And the, va the blood vessels that are in the cartilage meet up with the blood vessels that are in the bone and they form together. When that is happening, potentially a lesion can occur. 
And if there's damage to this, these vessels at that early age, and we're talking early, then sometimes it can resolve. The horse can, can heal that, it gets resolved, the, the ossification front keeps going, and you're left with nice, clean, articular cartilage. No worries. But if that damage to the vascular is severe enough and you can't have the proper uh, advancement of bone, of ossification, you get this indentation. This indentation, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's not resolved and repaired, can either become a cyst or it can become an OCD lesion if the articular cartilage becomes a flap. The important concept here, though, is all of this stuff is happening pretty early. We're looking at, we're diagnosing OCD at 300 days of age, but all of this stuff is occurring potentially from in utero through the first little bit of growth. So we've got a failure of blood supply happening very early on. You're getting three different uh, levels of osteochondrosis. This first one's latens is when it's still just in the cartilage, and a lot of those can resolve. We don't know how many can resolve in foals. They've studied it in pigs, and they see over 60% of them resolve, that they get better on their own. They go away. This manifests is when it's gotten into the bone, where you can see it radiographically even before you can see it. A lot of those can be repaired and they resolve, so you never see them in your survey x-ray. The ones you see in the survey x-ray are the ones that are, are more serious or the ones that become OCD lesions. We throw away the, the, around the term osteochondrosis and OCD for short, but they're not necessarily the same thing. The OCD is the flap that is potentially broken off, creating a fragment. So here we've got a real interesting scenario where this failure happened very early on, days, weeks, or months of age, and we're not diagnosing it until we see joint effusion or you do survey radiographs, at which time it might be too late to do anything about it other than operate. The real question is, could we affect this resolution and repair before they become OCD? Traditionally, we've thought it is what it is, it's going to create it or it's not going to create it. But that's what we're trying to study now. There's a lot of things that can cause this. Heredity confirmation, environment, nutrition certainly. We're honing in on body weight now, and we think that's an important uh, factor for early onset. Same thing happens in America as it happens in, in UK. The month they're born in, they're bigger in May than they are in January and February. Part of this early one too is you've got a lot more maidens then, so remember that. That's why they're smaller at that point. We also know there's this seasonal effect. I showed you before that this seasonal effect occurs in April in Kentucky. It occurs in May in UK. It's a month behind. So this growth spurt here occurs one month later. And if you look at the temperatures between Kentucky and UK, you can see why that as the temperature increases, as the soil warms up and grass starts to grow, it's offset by about a month. So is day length. We did a study looking at what effect this has on lactating mares and the growth of their foals. We studied 3,900 foals and, and mares, and we saw that spring pasture, this is mare daily gain when they're lactating, all of them are in positive weight gain. January and February, they're actually in negative weight gain. Uh, this is, again, because of changes in day length and temperature. This has an effect on foal growth. Foals grow slower in January and February early on. They grow faster in April and May, and so this has a big part to do with it. So what can we conclude from this study? We know month of birth affects body weight. That's absolutely clear, and it's probably related to pasture availability. It affects both what kind of nutrients the mare gets and what she gives to the foal, and also what the foal eats himself. It can affect the, the birth weight of foals and early growth, and later foaling mares tend to be affected the most. April and May foals are larger than February foals, 
and April and May foals have more stifle uh, OCD and fewer stakes winners than February foals. So whether there's cause and effect there, there's certainly a correlation. We know that stifle lesions are a problem. In our American data, lateral trochlear ridge and cyst are bad, and the lateral trochlear ridge is more affected by foal size than the cyst in our data. And part of this is if you look at the way the vessels that are oriented when that ossification front is moving, in the lateral trochlear ridge, those vessels are parallel to the ossification front. In the medial femoral condyle, they're perpendicular to the ossification front. So it may be the orientation of those vessels at that time of insult causes the difference in terms of the body weight effect here. That's just speculation. We have a lot more HOC OCD in the U.S. Fortunately, it's not that detrimental. I think what the difference here, though, is the size and conformation of the American dirt pedigrees. I think we're breeding a different type of horse for dirt racing in the U.S. than the English thoroughbred turf horse. They're bigger horses. They have more upright hind end conformation. And I think that's leading to a lot of these hock problems, uh, surgeries that we see. But again, it doesn't seem to have a big effect on performance. Maidens seem to, they're smaller and that seems to be protective against these different problems. So how do we manage this? Well, how do we manage large foals? I'm going to call a large foal here greater than 64 kilos. In our percentile scale, that's in the top 10%. That's greater than the 90th percentile. So big foals. Certainly, I think we should know if we have a big foal, weigh and measure them. And our, this software that we have makes it very easy to track their growth and calculate their percentiles. Identify them as high risk and know that they've got a higher susceptibility. They may not have it at all and go on and become uh, stakes winners, but identify them as they're more likely to have a problem. We need to look at potentially modifying their activity and exercise. That could be in terms of how big the turnout is and how many hours a day is, is they're turned out. That needs more study. In some instances, it may be more activity. In others, it may be less. That's an area we need to concentrate on. What about modifying the mare's ration? We're saying these May foals are big and have a higher tendency. Can we influence that by what we feed the mare? Probably we can, but see here, be careful because you could really screw up the brood mare and her reproduction if you get too extreme in that. So that's something I think certainly we may be overfeeding these mares as the grass becomes available, not realizing that they don't need as much hard feed. That needs to be monitored and calibrated, but you need to be careful that you don't go to extremes. And this is an interesting question, and we're going to have a panel discussion uh, in a few minutes of, of veterinarians from around here. Why, what about fall radiographs? We're taking radiographs mostly in spring surveys. If you've got weanling selling, you'll take fall rate radiographs, but it's not done routinely. And this is just, I want to hear everybody's opinion. Would fall radiographs help us identify some of the horses that have lesions that still have the chance of resolution? So far, the kind of the conventional wisdom is we don't want to uh, x-ray them in the fall because we're going to see a bunch of lesions that are going to go away anyway. And so you're, they're not going to be there. But the, the question is, can we have an effect on them if we know they're there? And so again, I think that's a topic of discussion. And are there other diagnostics other than their body size or radiographs that might give us a hint that these horses have some OCD that could uh, still be there? Can we feed and manage horses, uh, young foals, for resolution of those early onset lesions? Can we have uh, earlier supplementation of vitamins or minerals to help with the resolution? Again, I've got a question mark there. That's an area we need to study, uh, but it's a different mindset. We're looking at resolution rather than prevention at, in, in this case. And then finally, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that you can have really good foals from any different uh, size. Uh, this is a couple of horses 
that I picked out of our data sets. And the, the blue horse is an American horse. It was a multiple graded stakes winner, won over $3 million, and is now a successful stallion. This was his percentile as a foal, uh, suckling, weanling, and yearling. He was a little guy, went, but absolutely sound as a dollar, didn't have any OCD, went on to be successful. This is a very successful racehorse that if I said its name, you'd all know who it, it is. I won't say its name. Multiple graded stakes winner, won over $3 million, uh, heaps of group ones. And again, it was a small foal. So if you have a small foal, if it's not less than 44 kgs, uh, that certainly, if anything, might be a little protective against some of these problems, but big foals can be good too. This is an American filly. She won over a million dollars, won three uh, grade ones, and sold for 4.4 as a broodmare prospect. And you can see she was a gigantic foal. She was in the fourth quartile for body weight all the way along, but she was in that sweet spot of the third quartile for an American horse. So you can get there from either direction from big or small. So I'll, I'll conclude there just to say that I, I think that uh, for managing young growing horses, we need to know how big they are. And I think once we know that, we can start to make some observations about what we can do to actually improve their soundness and hopefully make better, sounder racehorses. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.